him on the um, opening slide. So I'll have to fix that before I um, put it up on the web. So I'm Andrew Cagney. I'm currently working on RFC 7296 and its successors and predecessors. So you can figure out what that is. So and anyway, today's talk, the title, is what happens when you try and combine dwarf, the debug information, lure an interpreter, and um, a kernel, put them all together and try and do things. So this talks about that. I've got so far with it, I'm not going to work out what I'm going to do next, so we'll look at it. I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to skip some. They're in there for reference. If someone says, hey, what about this? I can show you, yeah, look, this is what's probably going on. So I might skip some. So this is what I've been looking at. So the 30 second summary. So you have a Lua scripting language. It has a function and it might have a, lo have a variable reference which is scared HZ and you're referring to that variable. And you pull values out it and you print it. Now who here knows about Lua and scripting languages? Yeah, there's a few. So with a scripting language, name resolution happens while the program's running, is not done statically before time, things aren't assigned beforehand. When you get a reference to a name, it's resolved on the fly. So if you throw that script at Lua, Lua says, well, I don't know this variable called sked. I know what I is, it's a local variable, but I don't know what sked HZ is. So it has a look in the local variables, it's not in there. Then it goes and has a look at the global table. Is it in there? No. Then it says, well, you know what? I'll throw it at my containing environment. I'll say, hey, look, I've got this variable. Don't know what it is. Can you, go, you, know, can you figure it out? And so any scripting language can be set up to behave that way. Python, probably Ruby, all the rest of it. They all have that feature. You can hook names that don't get resolved. And so what do you do with a name? Well. In the case of what I'm looking at, I take that name, scaredHZ, it's a variable out of the NetBSD kernel. I go look in the debug information. The debug information says, well, I know the name, I know it's at this address, I know it's this length, and I know it's of this type. So now, with that knowledge, you can go to the kernel and say, hey, give me this memory of this length and pass it all the way back up to the interpreter. So if we go back here, I'm now I'm able to easily refer to variables that are found inside the kernel. There's no blip, 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 blip in quotes, I want you to evaluate this crud. It's just here, do this. And that's basically the idea of what I've been trying to look at and trying to implement. So that's what, why? Well, one of the NetBSD developers threw an email out saying, hey, I have a problem. I want to debug this. You don't need to read the text, you just, it's there for reference, but that's the email I said, you know what, this is hard, it should be easy. And the problems that he's describing, in a nutshell, is that he's got a structure, he's got a field, it's getting corrupted, he knows it comes into, it gets allocated off the heap or off the kernel <laughs> memory dynamically, so he doesn't know where it is, and then it gets added to a linked list. And then at some later stage, it gets pulled off the linked list. Somewhere between there, that memory gets smashed. And he wants to watch it. He wants to set up a watch point. Sure, why not? It's a very, very standard debugging problem. How do I go and watch a variable for just this lifetime? And so the question was actually saying, how can I do this as a program probably from C? But I went, nah, C's boring. C's for wins. Let's do it. Let's make it hard. Let's use a debugger. He's already pointed out you can't do it with DDB because DDB, the embedded debugger in the kernel, just doesn't have the knowledge to do and track that sort of thing. Maybe not what he asked for, but that's what we're going to go with. So let's try a debugger. So this is GDB. This is 1990. And that's how someone would have done it roughly 1990. Why roughly? I'll explain in a moment. You set a break on your function, you set a condition on the function, then you say, hey, when the condition triggers, do the following. Set up a watch point, save the watch point, and then in the delete function, whenever the same condition triggers, you delete the watch point. And so 
for the period of time that it's sitting in the queue between the add and the delete, you got your watch point installed. And that's actually pretty simple script. It's like, this is OK. Now, in 1990, watch points were added to GDB, but they were software watch points. In 1995, they got made into hardware watch points, so you could actually run this full speed. And then finally, in 2011, someone went, you know what? When you say PROF, you probably want to watch F and not care about P. And so they added the dash location thing. So it's taken a bit of time for them to get it working. And we can all assume LODB is trying to catch up to this sort of thing and add lots of options to make it really hard to type in. But they will do the same thing. So that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty clean. It's a nice, simple scripting language. So what's happened since 1990? Oh, and that's the other thing. You can use a watch, you can use this, and you can use debugger to connect GDB. You've got to use, what have we got here? We've got a um, proper serial, serial port, and of course we've got a JTAG device. You really want to avoid them when you're running, trying to debug a kernel. So maybe you can use the breakpoint script, but you really don't want to go near um, serial ports and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, I couldn't include the photo of me breaking my NSLU2, because I screwed up my soldering of its serial port. I threw it out. I wish I had that one. So, OK, that's a nice, simple way to solve this problem of watching two vari you know, watching a variable inside a kernel, catching the bug, seeing what's going on. But the cool thing at the moment is debugger extension languages. LODB has one. So, Let's look at the history of that. The first case I could find of an extension language was GDB and Tickle in 1999. A guy called Screw Grosman, I believe, basically lunged and Tickle into GDB and got the two to kind of work together. And then a second guy, Jim Ingham, started to clean it up and make it work. But the key th thing was, it wasn't really a scripting language for end users, it was a scripting language for debugger developers, and so it was all about the internals. It was not about end user experience. But that was 1999. Then, 2003, technically before then, but 2003 was a release that officially had it, GDB added this thing called MI. Now, ha ha ha, suffer LLDB, suffer. Because LLDB's implemented MI. You can blame me. So, what that did is it added a framework for interacting with a debugger through a well-defined interface. <coughs> so you could do things like add a scripting language. That was in 2003, in fact earlier. Tickle TK used it, but nothing else happened for a long time. Then in 2005, I was working on another debugger called Frisk. It was written in Java. I do not think you want to write debuggers in C or C++. So it's in Java. OK, let's see better scripting language. Java, it's dead easy. You just suck in Jython and, hey, look, you can do it. But look at this. Don't, you don't care about what it's doing. You just look about how many characters it's taken just to create a process. It's like terrible. I looked at this when we did it at the time. I went, no, nah, this is wrong. Let's just leave that to one side and focus on more important things. But hey, we proved the theory. Then in 2008, and again in 2014, GDB finally added Python bindings and then Go bindings. <coughs> but again, look at the syntax. And you go look at the LODB, they've got the same issue. They have these funny functions that get past strings to say, hey, look, give me my variable. What is my variable? Oh, look, here it is. Now we can start doing funny things with it. That's not for an end user. That's for someone that's hacking on the debugger. In Guile, same thing, because it's using this MI interface, it's basically been implemented the same way. Let's go and grub around the internals and expose all the internals to the users. Like, oh, that's terrible. So the same problem of set a breakpoint on a function, sorry, set a watch point when you hit one function, remove the watch point when you hit another function, can you do it with a detracing tool? Maybe they've got the hang of this. Uh, so I looked at system tap because I could get hold of the sources easy and I, could, I was more familiar with it. But dtrace given system tap is basically 
the ideas derived from it, I assume, is the same. But system tap is also slightly different in that it does at least use debug information to poke around with variables. It has some of the basic concepts of, yeah, look, if you could refer to an arbitrary variable, we can look it up in the de debug information of the kernel and set a, you know, set a watch point on it and stuff like that. So they're at least going in the right direction. They do have dollars in front of their variable names. They do require you to use an arrow for structure membership because of a syntax problem. That sort of thing you can live with, at least you can refer to arbitrary variables. However, just like with Dtrace, the restrictions, they've got security paranoia about sticking watching probes into the kernel. They do not like to let you do arbitrary things. And so at the moment, they probably don't allow you to set up at least I couldn't get it to work. I'm going to get it to trigger on well-defined address ranges. You're like, here, watch this address, which is statically defined. I couldn't say, watch an address that we've just computed on the fly. It wouldn't let you do that. And I assume that's just para reasonable paranoia. There's nothing wrong with a paranoia. It's reasonable paranoia. This is a running production system. We don't want you screwing around doing weird things. But I also have a suspicion that authors will now go out and do it. So that's system tap. So the question, going back to this original problem again, could we do something like this? If you, again, it's using Lua. Break the add function. That's just a symbol. Find the add function. And then we're in that code. If p.f, Lua syntax, we can't use arrows, is 1. Then we set a watch point on that field. And then when we hit delete function, we remove that watch point. Can we do something like that? Why not? Again, you're getting away from all this dot, dot, obscure kernel interior stuff, dot, dot, dot. Let's try and make it something simple. So another problem. This one from Greg. My kernel doesn't boot. My kernel's different. I built it, and it's different. I don't know why. And he roots around and he says, I've got different machine code out of the compiler. What do I say? Oh, you've structure blah has changed size. <coughs> I mean, what the expletive? How do you figure that out? So where do I get that? Well, it's magic. You look at the 548, you then go and look at the debug information, and you go, oh look, there is a 548 just here. Magic number. Oh, I know what that variable is then. From that variable, oh, I know what that type is then. From that type, hey, it's probably this has changed size because if that size defines how things are put on the stack. That's, you know, I, know I can do that and I do that in my sleep because I've done that in day jobs. Typical people don't do that. So you go look at languages that have tried to do dwarf bindings. What do they look like? This is just a random language I pulled off the web. Pi elf tools, but they're all the same. It's, well, we have a die. We'll get to what dies are later, and we pluck things out, and then we go iterating through children, and we start looking for magic numbers. It's like, that's just horrible. It's not any easier. What about, hey, I have my variable. That's the function. Get the dwarf for it. Then just iterate through the variables and start pulling out information and print out the information. Much easier, again, much cleaner. And I think much more intended for, say, what a user is doing. You know, would something like this be possible? And now, third reason, why did I end up looking at the kernel? I have, I'm on the Dwarf Steering Committee, and we get all these ideas. Here, wouldn't you like to do this to make Dwarf debugging better? It's like, Mm, sure, it looks good in theory, yeah, okay. I want to be able to look at some of the ideas and actually test them and say, does this really help big programs? Yeah, things like improving speed, improving size. I need a test environment. I need a rather large program. Kernel's a rather large program. So I think, yeah, let's just try and use the kernel. Actually, it's, it's in fact, the bigger program than the first program I prodded to do with size problems. You know, a customer at a company once came up and said, our, we can't debug our program. Why not? 
Every time we try to debug it, the machine stops. Oh, how big is it? Well, the debug info is, you know, a couple meg. Machine is 500 meg. This is a few years ago. And so they ran the debugger on it, and the debugger would go and get this half meg of data and turn it into more than half a gig of internal memory information. It's, just, it's this expansion, this bizarre expansion. It's like, why? And so all the emphasis now with Dwarf, a lot of it is to do with, don't do that. Leave it on the disk. Leave it where it is. Have fast index tables, fast lookups, so you can just pluck out the thing you need. And so I need a big data set to say, hey, look, is this actually working in the real world? Ah, kernel's a good C program. Makes a challenge. So now how? The theory. You're actually doing OK for time. So now we get into what the heck a die is and a CU is and all the rest of it. I'm afraid this gets a bit dry, so I'll try me fast. So in Dwarf, you have sections. Yeah, if you ever do obs dump dash um, s, probably a big s or something, you see all these sections, dot debug this, dot debug that, dot debug everything else. Most of them are not relevant at the moment. The key one is debug info. It describes your program. It really describes your program. It describes every single detail of your program. It describes where your <coughs> functions are, where your variables are, whether in registers, memory, blah, blah, blah. It describes everything. And that's why it is so big. And as a footnote, there's a lot, lot more detail in dwarf debug information than there ever has been in stabs. And as again, why it's, it gets big. But at least the information's there so you can find stuff. So here we have a simple function, f, with some calculations with a global and a local. And so you see the bottom one first. That is for the global g. So it says, hey, look, we have a variable g. Its type is at 0x61, and we go up to 0x61. Oh, that's a type. It's assigned int, and it's of size 4. So that's just described it. It's implied because of other things that this is whatever the byte order is on that machine. But you can actually tell it, hey, look, this is a khaki Indian, so it's a little Indian machine, because you're running on a proper big Indian machine. Um, and then you have a look at the function. The function says, hey, I have function f. That's my name. I'm at an address, I have a parameter, and my parameter, p, is at fb reg minus 36. So it's on the stack at the frame base, offset down 36. So with that information, you can find everything to do with that program, the global, the function, everything to do with it. You can use that information. But it's big. For the kernel, it's about 16 meg. Really big. Now, to use that information, you can then construct an object. So you have a name, like a variable g. It has a lot type. It might have an int. So g, in our case, g has an int type. And it has a memory address. You might have a more complex structure, like a strut s that's an int 64 and an int 32, something complicated like that. And you see that the top one is the types. And then the bottom one is where each byte of that type is at the moment. This, at the moment, happens to have 32 bits, say, in a register, 32 bits in memory. That split, that 64-bit int's been split for some reason. Compilers do weird things. And then the other integer, j, is just sitting in a register. Notice that the registers are not, may not be contiguous. You can't assume anything. But the debug info says, look, this is where you go find that variable at this instant in time. And if you want to refer to s.j, we just refer to the last small section of it. There's that variable. And so, objects. Hmm. Object oriented y stuff, which is why I don't think C is too good. And then we get a Lua. OK, so if we come back here, we have objects. Lua has objects. We can probably model this pretty easily in Lua using Lua has tables. Everything's a table in Lua. Or if you use Python, I guess it'd be a dictionary. So you can model that in Lua. Now also in Lua, what can you do? You can add some primitives. You can say, hey look, from within my Lua script, give me, a, give me an address in memory. Here, peek at this address in memory. 
So you're running Lua, it says, okay, here's a, here's a random byte in the kernel. Not for people running production system. Worse, here, let's poke a random byte in the kernel. Here, give us, the you know, give us a register from the kernel. And referring again to this previous slide, you have a type, you have a location, so we can implement a location as a sequence of little bytes out of the Lua memory, out of using P. Just if we want byte one, we get byte one using a P. We can implement that. And registers, same idea. We can just implement that. So combining the two together, we get a variable as a table. Now, whenever you refer to a field of a table like s.j, it goes looks in the table for it. If it's not in the table, it goes to a meta table in Lua. I don't know how Python does. You know, it, has, it has dictionaries somewhere or other. So, and in the meta table, there's a function called index. It says, hey, look, I want to know what j is. And so you call the index function. It says, all right, let's go look up the dwarf, find out where this variable j really is in memory using the debug information, and then we return a, an object describing that this variable s.j is in this location here, and it has this type. And if you want to do a two, you know, things like if you go my variable to string, turn it into a string, other functions get called and they can be dealt with the same way. So we now have a way to map, in theory, the dwarf, the Lua constructs and Lua expressions directly onto dwarf. And we also have a way to map that dwarf directly onto the kernel. So just quickly, I'll skip that one, but I will do this one. So acceleration tables. As I mentioned, the dwarf is 16 meg in size for the kernel. There is an accelerator table called pub names. That's only 2 meg in size. That's the old dwarf standard. They're trying to figure out a new one. But the compilers I had generated that is considered not very reliable and there are good reasons for it. You can't trust that there's stuff in there. But it's an experiment. I'm going to trust it. The pub names is just the big, it basically scrapes the debug information and finds every single name in every public name, so it's a global or a local. So if it's, a, it's got an address, memory, if memory address is not on the stack, it should be in the pub names and just makes a big long list of them. And so you can then, instead of going through all the debug information, you can go scan through the pub names, find the variable you're looking for, and also, hey look, it's over here in the debug information, get a, get a quick access, you get a lot quicker access, in theory. But it's a linear search. Oh well, skip cool frames, we don't want to know about them. If someone asked a question. So how far have we got? So, okay. Step one, add Lua to the kernel. Ah, easy. My only suggestion for the kernel people is please create a library. <laughs> it's like, I just bashed, you know, this is a hack, I'm bashing it in. So I just add, went to files.ddb, which is a list of the files that go into DDB. So yeah, stick these extra Lua files in here. Hey, look, it compiles. Someone did some good work. But having a library to pull in would be easier. The other things I did have to do, I don't know why, I had to turn some warnings off. Well, I don't know. So, add Lua to the debugger. That one again is pretty easy. You get the book that says, this is how you learn Lua. I didn't mention I'm learning Lua. You copy the text in, then you discover that it's for the old version of Lua. And you go and read in the internet. The internet says, well, this is the same code for the new version. What do you do? You call DDB's read line. You remember to change the prompt to Lua, otherwise you get very confused, as I did the first time this worked. I'm looking at a DB prompt going, oh man, this hasn't worked, I've screwed up something. So you have a Lua prompt, you pull in the text, you throw it at Lua, tell Lua to interpret it, and then repeat. This is the really simple version of a loop. There's a more fancy version, but ah, that works. And for the moment, at the moment, for the moment, I'm you go into Lua, you do operations, and then you just drop out, and it tries to garbage collect everything. 
really I should keep the Lewis state around. So when you come into DDB a second time, you have all the old Lewis state with you somehow. Ah, this is an experiment. So far, so good. Find a bug. Always find bugs. So, simple thing. Look, it all works, right? You print 100,000 or something. No, it's one, two, three. Print a million and you get back 100. Ooh, what have I screwed up? Thankfully, that one wasn't me. Someone somewhere decided that you could alias SNPrintf because you, Lua uses SPrintf to be S and the size of S. And of course, if S is a pointer, size of S is 4. doesn't matter how much buffer space there is. So, one bug. Then the interpreter starts working. That's pretty good again. Next thing. All right, we need our debug information. NetBSD already churns out a debugged, a dwarf version of the kernel. It drops it in. For some reason, it's called GDB. I'm sure someone's going to say, hey, let's change it to LLDB in the next week. Well, whatever. So you take that kernel, and at the moment, what happens is that GDB, the bug kernel gets pulled apart, and you end up with a strip kernel, and the strip kernel is what you load into memory. I'm doing the opposite. I'm throwing away all the useful bits and keeping all the debug information. And so what numbers do we have now? So we have text of the kernels, a couple meg, data is 0.3 of a meg. I think my numbers are right. Netbsd.debug is 18 meg. This is getting big. So a total of about 20, 22 meg. So I've now got 22 meg of stuff. I'm about to go and stuff into a kernel. Sidebar, what do we get for all that money or memory? You get debug, okay, I was out. It's 11, 12 meg of debug information. The abbreviations, don't worry about that. Um, strings, every name you see is in the string table. A ranges, accelerator table, quickly go from an address into the debug information. Line number table, hey, you stop somewhere. Tell me what the file name of the line number is. Yeah, it's only a meg. Pub names, like I said, is 2 meg. I think the new one, the proposed change will be bigger. Locations, ranges, that's all to do with finding variables and finding addresses because things aren't necessarily contiguous. And finally, debug frame, that lets you do unwinding. And just a side bar. So NetBSD kernels, for some reason, include unwind information. I have no idea why. There's no unwinder in there. If you go into DDB and it wants to do an unwind, then probably you should just stick the debug frame information in a side and use that if you're really going to do it as an unwinder, which is what I'm looking at anyway. So get this huge big 18 meg blob, stuff it in a kernel. How do I do that? Again, easy. Someone's done this before. Maybe not like this, but hey, what do I care? There's a thing called copy sim tab to copy the old fashioned sim tab into the kernel. There's also stuff to copy RAM, memory into the, sorry, file systems in the kernel, all of that. So we just steal that code and bash it a few times and there we are. We have a what, 22 meg kernel. Here's our kernel. And here's this huge, huge chunk of memory containing all our symbol information. Easy. Ah, find a bug. Which, to be honest, is pretty surprising. Again, only one issue. I mean, who in the right mind builds 22 megabyte kernels. So the bug was on the arm. Someone assumed that kernels would never be 22 meg, so I had to adjust an end point a little bit. And kernel boots, still easy. So then we add, go back to Lua. We've now got this blob that contains debug information. We've got Lua, and we've got a kernel. And we can get into the Lua, we can get into the debugger, we can get into Lua. So let's give access to random bits of memory. So what do I do? I just add a couple of functions, a couple of little hooks called um, peak to look at a memory address and a couple of variables saying, hey, this is, my, um, this is where this big, huge blob of debug information is. So who's figured out what those numbers are? Room full of geeks and they can't read ASCII and decimal. Wow. It spells ELF. Yeah. Ah. This says it works. <laughs> Here we are with a huge big kernel. And I can get at the ELF header 
of the debug information from Lua from inside DDB. This is a good thing. This is saying, so far we haven't screwed up. Mind you, I find the build system a bit frail, and if I do screw up, um, I don't end up with anything in there, but I don't end up with a dead build. So I'm going to get some things to detect failure statuses and bath instead of lunging on. But who cares? So, yep, oh, I've got a slide out of order. So, embedded it. Oh, that's the last one, sorry. So the last thing is, we've got Lua. We want to run Lua. How do we run our Lua script inside the kernel? Ah, oh, I know. I'll just do what I did before. Just get all my scripts, concat them all together in my trademarked and probably patented LAR format, which is lousy archive format, which consists of name, null, file, null, and throw that in the kernel. Now, We've even got all this script stuff. You can't assume for a debugger in a kernel that, well, you're going to be able to get to the file system to go and get your scripts and all the rest of it. So, and in my case, I'm going into the debugger at the, um, what is it? It's asking for the root file system. I go, no, screw you. I'm going to go into the debugger at this point. We've got nothing. So all the Lua scripts I'm writing get stuffed into the kernel. It could be done better. You could probably build a proper file system and put that in there and all sorts of things. I mean, you could even stick source code in this blob. So you can do lists and see bits of the source code that you're interested in. But that's getting silly. And that's also about 100 meg or so. It's only memory. That's the thing. It's not 4 meg like my, the VAX I learnt to hack on. Sorry, 4K. The 4K and the uh, Trash 80. Is it 4K? Man, it, feel, it feels wrong. It's like my numbers are all out, several orders out. Hair. Yes. <laughs> what hair? So, finally, let's find a dwarf library. Writing dwarf libraries, I've done one. It's called Inua. It's like, how hard can this be? So I wrote one in Java. Yeah, let's find a dwarf library so we can stick that in there and avoid some work. Well, let's go through the list. There's um, DAs, or there's libdwarf, it's GPL 2.1. It's kind of actually the best option for the moment. It's just C. It is LGPL though. That may not go well with some folk. And it requires a libelf. It's like, yeah. So you're going down this hole. But on the other hand, libdwarf is been used to churn out experimental dwarf for all the proposed standards. And so it's been used for that. So whether whatever happens, I'll probably use libdwarf to generate information to stick in the kernel and play with. Then there's ELF utils, which I discovered recently changed quite, well, it's been L, GPL v3 for a while, but I didn't actually realise that it got changed again. And it comes with an attitude. If you know the author, you know why it has attitude. Then there's libunwind. I've actually used libunwind in a previous project. It's not really remote friendly, it's not good. They say it is, but it's really not good for some situations when you're trying to do debugging in, in strange situations like we have here where you're crossing boundaries between one language and another. It struggles. There's LLVM, C, C++. I think we should add the entire compiler suite to the kernel. It's already silly enough. There might be bits there that are salvageable, like the unwinder might be able to get standalone. And then there's Inua, which I said, right, I mean, I'm getting desperate here. It's written in Java. We don't realistically put it in there, but at least I have a reference to say, this is how you do the dwarf. I, know, you know, I can go back to that and say, well, this is what I need to do. Sigh. I did not want to write dwarf. So plan B. Write dwarf. So that's on the left is typical operations for a um, debugger. Backtrace, print a ver local variable, print a global variable, break in a function, break file name, line number. Um, things like that. And on the right is all the bits of debug information you need to be able to read before you can do something useful. And some of them you can see horrendous. Like print a local variable, you need the frame, you need address ranges, you need the debug info, the abrieve. 
then debug ranges. It's a lot of stuff to get through. But print global, at least with that one, is kind of reasonably contained. So I decided oh, I'll start working on that one. So, okay. If we're going to write dwarf, we're going to have to read elf. So, get an elf reader in Lua. What the heck? Yes, my syntax is messy. I'm still learning Lua. I should not need those parentheses, but I do. So, require DDB. DDB is a little object written in Lua, stuffed into the kernel here around the Lua, and it gets given the address of where my debug information is. Just, hey, look, here's an elf file, an 18 gig elf file. It's you know, 30 gigabit, ah, blah, 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 here it all is. Hey, I can get it by elf. Then we go and parse the pub names. We have our elf. So the next thing to do is pass that to Dwarf and say, hey, look, go look up main. So it goes off to debug information, scans it all. Footnote here, remember, I'm using little byte peaks doing this. This is going to be rather slow. Scan through the whole thing. Worst case, linear search, got to go through the whole two, was it two meg? And it takes 30 seconds. Ah, okay. Time to take a step back. Time to go and find a faster table or a better library. So that is actually how far I've got in coming up to this. So what have I learned so far, having got just that far with a silly exercise? Well, the first thing, Lua has a dark side. Yeah, the irony, yes. So, everyone says Lua is wonderful. But the things you can't do that are going to make it to be a pain. Simple one is arithmetic. There's no thing to say, given my object, turn this object into an integer for me so that I can do integer arithmetic easily. Instead, I'm going to have to implement all the little functions that do add, subtract, and all the rest of it for all my objects. And it's also, I suspect, going to be a bit painful when it comes to dealing with a variable plus one, doing all the hooks to do that. Because Lua won't let me say, here, this meta table here, I want to do an override of that so I can play funny games with it. Lua doesn't pass what's known as the copy-paste test to debuggers. I think people can live with that. The copy-paste test of a debugger is, you go to an arbitrary bit of your source code, copy it, right into the expression evaluator and it just prints out the value. It's a really high bar to set and with Lua's syntax you can't meet that bar. Maybe we can hack Lua a bit to be a, you know, let a few more things through but again I think we can leave that. Some of those arrows I can change them to dots and whatever else. So just again it's a limitation. And the other one in doing all this I found I can't overload properly the equality operator, some of the operators. So for instance, if I want to compare a variable to a string, you read the manual in a shallow way and it says, yeah, you just override this thing called EQ and it'll get cool, cool and it will work. No. Lua has tricks in there to do it's just with spring, strings and doing comparisons. It says, yeah, I only do this comparison if it's one of these special cases. If you do a string, doesn't work. So, so again, you're going to have to come up with some hack to get around that. If anyone knows Laura and can tell me how to do this and say, no, 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 you're wrong, you just do this, please, please tell me. So, what next? Ooh, good timing. Or, you yeah, know, what to do next? I've got so far, things haven't gone completely pear shaped, but I'm hitting problems. So, the first is I've got to have to change DDB so that when an event comes in, like a watch point trigger or something, it goes straight into the Lua interpreter. DDEB is going to go to one side. If I have that coming in, then you can start to say, hey, look, set up this watch point on a watch point and run this script. And of course, dwarf, test, more dwarf, test, more dwarf, and more testing of that. So the hack kernel and all the scripts are up on Bitbucket. And I got an email from Bitbucket saying, don't create repos more than two gig in size. It's only one point something gig. They don't like that. Um, so other than that, any questions or any one want to know any information? Yep. So um, DDB sometimes has to operate in really constrained modes like NMI contacts. Um, how do you go with running like your, uh, with, if it has to be? 
Yeah, so in hacking Lure in, I just call the kernel's memory allocator, which is like, no, 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 no. I think I'm going to have to allocate another huge chunk of memory and tell Lure, this is your heap. This is where you get your memory from and let it manage that separately. Because if, if you pre-allocate that memory right, you can just run it. Um, that's a risk. Shouldn't. Yeah, so the way I'm, that's one of the things I'm trying to do here if you go way back. So here, like I said, traditional debuggers would, they had a lot of data to suck in and it was stabs and there was no indexing table, nothing. So they would just try and speed up by sucking it all into memory and that is a lot of memory. So trend now is just literally leave everything on disk and drop stuff if it's not been used anymore. And if that's going on, yeah, it should really constrain the memory requirements of it. But I haven't looked at that. I mean, the scanning all the pubs, like I said, it takes 30 seconds. Every single string it's pulling in at the moment is creating an object, but the object has just been dropped on the floor and so the garbage collector would be kicking them out pretty quickly. And if you're told, oh, no, no, you've only got this much space, it'll really aggressively kick them out. So I think you can constrain it well, but I'll need to hack it again to give it a predefined chunk of memory and say, okay, this is your, this is your playground. The other reason is, to your point, um, Lua should not be screwing around with a memory allocator. If you're in a debugger, you should leave the memory allocator alone because you're probably debugging it. Sorry, in the back. Well, that's the thing, it's like, can we do this? Turns out you can. Now let's just play. <laughs> so, so have you thought about uh, writing some thin set of, I mean, basically, since you're putting it into memory anyway, you should be able to put it in whatever format you want. So if you want to put it in for a hash table instead of the flat list it's in now, you can do it. And you can write a thin C, very thin C function to go get the data you want out of the hash table. Like Pre-process it. Right, so... Um, okay, there's several answers. One is what people do outside of kernels and outside of this constraint is they go and gzip the data, which makes it singularly useless. It just turns into white noise. You now can't even get at it. So forget that. That one's useless. The next one is, like I said, the dwarf, there's a proposals on the table for dwarf to generate a proper hash table and a pretty compressed hash table that contains actually everything. And so Dave Anderson, DA, his version of LibDwarf, that version for people who don't know, came out of SGI and is kind of the, one of the original LibDwarf bits of code base. He's hacking his thing, because he's also on the committee, to generate this sort of information. Because he wants to verify what's being proposed and say, if I can understand the standard enough to generate the data, then probably the standard's okay. And in my point of view, I'm saying, well, if you're doing that, I'm quite happy to take this compressed information which we probably like what you're proposing, and stick that in there instead. And it would be a lot faster. The proposal is roughly, if you've got a name, you just do a single hash and a lookup, and that'll tell you the compilation unit. Compilation unit's for a file, and everywhere else to go and find it. And the proposal also pins down exactly what should be in the hash table. At the moment, pub names, it's a bit of a crabshoot as to whether the variable will be in there or not. Like I mentioned, local variables, you know, static in something. Is that in the pub names table? It depends on what mood the compiler writer was in at the time. Because <laughs> the standard never said you, you need all these things in the table to make it useful. And so the result is stuff wasn't in there. And the next consequence was the debuggers went, this is useless. I scan the table, I don't find the function. <sighs> I'm going to scan the debug information to see if it's really there. Singularly useless. So, totally agree uh, with your suggestion of, yeah, generate better debug information and long term, try and figure out ways to get it also smaller. You know, like I said, if we can rewrite the, what comes out in C and make it smaller and more compact, like, where's an example? Here. So, 
This is out of GCC. So you have this thing called DWAT frame base. Anyone that's done compilers will know you have a frame base, then you have an offset, and you have the variable on the stack. That thing is actually completely redundant. You don't need it because CFI, cool frame information, figures out the frame base for you. And so you can eliminate redundant information in there and again, compact the data. So if we can write C code to make this data more compact, probably we can get a look at it and get a change into the standard to make the data more compact. And that's, it's, in a way, that's one of my motivations to say, let's look at this, let's push what's going on. Yep? So you mentioned that in some cases the Lewis syntax doesn't let you do copy paste like error. Yeah. So what do you do with complex expressions where you have things that are a mix of arrows and dots? You have to turn all the arrows into a dot. And look at Java. Java got rid of the arrow. I don't know what. Yeah, first came out of it. What are they thinking? Actually, it's like it's just the syntax. It's like you know, you have an object, you know what its type is. So if you see a dot, you know in this context that dot means the following. So if I say print foo, yeah. what do I mean? Yeah. What do I, what, um, the question is for you, what do I mean? Well, if you've got, if you've got a file foo.c and bar.c and they've both got functions in them yeah. called foo, but they're static so they don't conflict, then you need some way of telling Qualifying it. Qualifying yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, so there's two answers. One is, the, the horrible answer is, instead of a variable, you have a function. Someone says break. Uh, what's a good function? Strew a copy or strew a land. Probably it's a C function in a header that is inlined everywhere. So if someone says break strew a copy, and they really mean break strew a copy, they mean every single instance of strew a copy needs to get a breakpoint put on it. And the debugger actually has to deal with that situation. It took a long time for GDB to figure that out. LODB does do it a lot better because they knew that was a problem very early on. Apple contributed patches to GDB to try and handle multiple breakpoints. So that's some history there. So you need to deal with that situation. When someone says, Sup, show me this, they might actually mean all the different instances. Debugging info tells you all the different instances, but man, it can be a lot. That's the first one. The second one is, yeah, you need to be able to qualify. The PTools group, which existed in the 90s, a parallel, de had a de parallel debugger subgroup, and they came up with a syntax that looked like that. And you can parse it. If you find the hash, you can go that way, figure out that's a file, and that's a symbol. So file.c hash foo. That won't work in Lua but probably you can come up with something else. Yeah. And that's what Apple should have done, <laughs> sorry. That's the way to specify the file name and the local variable of a thing. Is that, it's actually a really good syntax. The people looking at it must have been thinking, you know what, file.c colon foo is just a screw up. You can't parse that reliably. You don't know what that is because of C and C++. And so it's probably a hack a syntax quirk we can come up with to have the same effect because I just don't want to have quotes. But if all else fails, I don't know, percent quote, <laughs> something silly like that. Yeah, suggestions welcome because I haven't figured it out. That's what I'm trying to do. So, first question is, how does that scale if the objects that you want to put watch points on are numerous? Like, you wouldn't have a single W, you'd need a whole array of them, or a dictionary of them, whatever. Um, okay, first to cheat, when I, my pub names look up, it returns a list. So if you went watch this here, um, you would probably, the answer is, the short answer is you probably run out of hardware watch points really quickly. The long answer is that p.f, when it gets f, 
it has a location list description saying where F is. And you need to look at that location list saying this is, all, this is where F goes for this lifetime of this variable F. And you have to set all of that. And then you have to go and look at all the instances that the function's been in line because of all of them. And you just, yeah, you end up with a lot of information and a lot of waiting. And I think it'd be reasonable to say, look, this is, do you really want to do this? But you're going to run out of um, hardware watch points long before you get to that. Because what would be fascinating would be, regardless of the, the number of watch points, ignore that issue again for a minute. Um, if you ran this, you hit a watch point, you get a break, and then you have some kind of Lua function that you can run. Sure, I mean. Where you say, ignore this one. This one is valid. Like basically, disable the watch point immediately before this and rename it after this. Because this, this operation is one that's working correctly. And then you could gradually trim out all of the correct accesses to the, the data that you want to ignore, and then you know, let it run for a while until you trigger the, you know, the highs and lows. You kind of have to start out with a single, in, in single stepping. <laughs> which would be horrible because you'd probably run out of watch points. Or, you, with an, I mean, another evil way is, if you know rough, if everything's constrained, you get into high performance, buzzword, breakpoints and stuff, uh, where instead of setting the breakpoint on this little bit here using hardware register, you get rid of the page. Or you do something that just will force a page fault for an entire chunk. As that gets your breakpoints to scale a lot more, and then from there, yeah, I mean, if it's got the data structure and the data structure, which will be a list of, well, when we say watch here, it's actually this big long list thing, you start pruning them out and saying, oh, get rid of this entry in the list, get rid of this entry in the list. The key thing is you, get, you want to make it accessible. And sorry, Python, is, the way they embedded Python in GDB and LODB is just terrible. <laughs> It, it's, what was it called yesterday? It's, um, I can't remember the word, but it's evolved and it, do, it has all these horrible quirks, but on the other hand, you can go break something and it always works. Yeah. You don't have to go dash dash file as is, dash dash line as is, dash dash something else. It, it's more, because the um, truth is if someone hits that, they're not going to use the debugger. They go, Apple's users don't use the debugger. They use Xcode, and Xcode happens to use their debugger. I'm sure they'll disagree, but that's the truth. <laughs> yeah? Um, you mentioned that you were getting an ELF debug and you were getting a randis in the kernel. Yep. Would that be something that in the future the debugger should be doing? Just it's in the kernel, so. Oh. Well, it's, just, it, it's already in the image, so the, the bootloader, it, I mean, I presume you did that because it's ignoring those. So I did that because it's easy. It's like someone's done this. Someone knows how to stuff extra blobs into a kernel, so I'll copy that code. Are you thinking more of the lines of you get the, not the, hang on, which loader? You get the preloader or whatever it is prompt, and at the preloader prompt you say, here, load my kernel. And is, you're talking at that point there. I mean, at that point there, I actually wondered at one point, maybe I can hack that to say, hey, look, load my symbol table, then load my kernel, so I don't have to smash the two together. Yeah, so the only it's like, you know, the, the open PST loader goes and it, it loads the line number information if it sees it in yeah. the image, but it ignores other things. But it seems like you could just say, okay, well, here's a list of um, dwarf sections that if, if I see them, I'll actually load them. Does it tweak the um, header for the debug info? Because uh, the all debug info sections except DH frame have a mark, aren't in the program headers or they aren't in the chunks that get loaded by default. But you can tweak one and say, look here, load this chunk as well. You might be doing that. I'm, I'm speculating, so I don't know. Or he just says, hey, look, I see this section here. I'll just stick it over here, screw it away in a section of memory. Uh, cool. Yeah, so I'm probably more familiar with the previous one, but, but basically, you know, there's like our, our symbol table information at the end of it sees it. Yeah. That's a good idea, yeah. Along the same lines, you could stuff the data into a kernel module, make it float up. What can any of this do? 
It doesn't work. So a side segue, so I forgot my battery, my charger for my laptop, so I can't boot it and show you. But I'm going into DDB at the root, at the um, file system. Give me my root file system prompt. We don't have a file system. We don't have any kernel modules or anything else like that. I mean, it's an option, but if you're bringing up a kernel, <laughs> You don't have much at all around. You're lucky if the ser if you're lucky if the hardware engineer hasn't screwed up the serial port, as I once encountered. Why doesn't my serial port code work? Well, using this oscilloscope, it's wired wrong. Hack, hack, hack. Board solder, solder. Yeah, here's your serial port. Now it works. Anything else? Okay. Thank you.